from KGW, this is The Good Stuff. The party is underway on this Fat Tuesday. Crowds gathered along Bourbon Street for the Mardi Gras Parade, featuring floats and dancers and other street performers. Thank you for joining us for The Good Stuff. I'm China Green. Mardi Gras is the last big hurrah before Ash Wednesday and Lent begins for people all over the world. And this year, the celebration in New Orleans is expected to be quite grand, with post-pandemic crowds showing up for a good time. NBC Sam Brock is there. It is officially Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Do I need to say any more? That evokes so many images, not just for people living in the greater New Orleans area and the state of Louisiana, but all over the country and all over the world. I'm standing right now in this warehouse in front of the Rex floats. Rex, of course, being king of carnival. This is the oldest parading organization that is connected with Mardi Gras. One of the incredible things about it is that there are six iconic floats, but then 20 of them are replaced every single year. This one right here is the festive, speaking to a particular mythology or narrative. That is, in fact, a cockroach on the very top. Look at the level of detail involved as well, just down to the golden fringes of the flowers. That's just one float. We talk about the cuisine creole. How do you not like this one celebrating New Orleans food history from crabs to flounder all the way on the other side is my favorite personally, the gumbo. And the amount of effort and time that goes into each one of these floats is about an entire month's of work, all done 20 times over for all of these floats. The event itself, the parade of course, starts at 10.30 local, goes for about four hours. It's a five mile route right through the heart of New Orleans cultural touchstone, St. Charles Avenue. We're talking about majestic mansions, oak trees, and all of those families lining the streets where the oldest streetcar in the country goes right through. The perfect convergence of all these incredible elements of New Orleans all on display for this epic celebration. In New Orleans, Sam Brock, NBC News. Man, seeing that live is definitely on my bucket list. This one also, it's another Mardi Gras tradition in Louisiana. It's the chicken run. Revelers in the small Acadia town of Brazil came out for the costumes uh, for the tradition this morning. Cajun Mardi Gras involves the chicken run in which costume revelers, they travel the countryside gathering ingredients for a communal pot of gumbo. Some walk, others are on horseback and they chant, sing, they play instruments like accordions, fiddles and washboards and it just sounds fun. Meanwhile, Portland's Mardi Gras parade is about to begin. People look stoked with all their gear and umbrellas and masks and whatnot. Taking a live look where the crowd is gathered right now. Each year, the Misty Crew of Nimbus hosts the free family friendly parade along North Mississippi Avenue. As you can see, people dress up, go all out. They'll be dancing, they'll be throwing things to parade goers and restaurants and bars in the area will have specials going on all night long. I have a couple of friends here that would like to give you a present. Is that okay? How can I turn that down? Come on in. Oh, just ahead of Valentine's Day, some residents of our key assisted living facility in Tualatin were visited today by some cupids. This is the 11th annual Cupid Crew. It's a campaign aimed at uplifting older Americans during the Valentine's Day holiday. The crew was made up of third and fifth graders from Hayhurst Elementary in Southwest Portland. Staff at Marquis are also part of the fun. The crew puts together handmade cards and roses to bring some love into the lives of senior residents. Our residents don't have families or spouses anymore and, and a lot of times uh, it, it lands on us. And so this program is fantastic because we can bring in the community, our staff, um, students, and engage with our residents, bring a little joy to them, bring, bring them a rose, and you know, just put a smile on their face. To date, Cupid Crew volunteers have impacted over 750,000 older Americans nationwide around Valentine's Day. And check this out, is the world's tallest Valentine lighting up in the Miami skyline. This is the Paramount Miami World Center skyscraper. It's about 700 feet tall and they'll keep this LED Valentine's greeting up through tomorrow. They say they want to make sure everyone gets a little bit of love this year.
And then the day before Valentine's Day, I don't know if you know this, it's known as Galentine's Day. It's a time set aside to celebrate female friendship. And a KGW viewer, Mary, shared this photo of the ladies in her hiking event group called Girls Gone Wild. Waited all day to say that on air. They have over 180 members. This is a shot from an axe throwing party. Looks like they are very fun. And then Jennifer shared this photo of her monthly game night with a group of gals, all smiles. And I believe there's a guy in attendance, so maybe it's not just for girls. But hey, we want to see your gal or guy in tains, guy in tines day. Is that a thing? We'll do that. Uh, pictures of any of those things, anything good happening in your community, you can text us at 503-226-5088 or email us the good stuff at kgw.com. In today's Breaking Barriers segment, we are highlighting Hattie Redman, who helped women in Oregon get the right to vote. Her impact on the women's suffrage movement went largely unnoticed until recently, and now she is getting the recognition she deserves. Many women played a pivotal role during the women's suffrage movement of the early 1900s, and one of those is Hattie Redmond. She helped lay the groundwork for the black civil rights movement several decades later. This is the only picture we have of Hattie. She was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1862. Her family moved to Hood River before eventually settling in Portland by 1880. Hattie held suffrage meetings and lectures at Mount Olivet Baptist Church that once stood here at the corner of Northwest Broadway and Everett. During the campaign for suffrage in Oregon in 1912, she was president of the Colored Women's Equal Suffrage Association. The campaign was successful in Oregon, and in April of 1913, she got her voter registration card. It wasn't until 1920 that the 19th Amendment passed, granting women the right to vote nationwide. Hattie passed away in 1952 at the age of 90. Her contributions went largely unknown until 2012 during the centennial celebration of women's suffrage. Historians discovered details of her life and uncovered her grave marker at Lone Fir Pioneer Cemetery that was buried years after her death. In recent years, Oregon State University has renamed the Benton Annex Building to the Hattie Redman Women and Gender Center. And here in Portland, the Hattie Redman Apartments opened last year on North Interstate Avenue in the Kenton neighborhood. It's long-term housing for people with disabilities who are experiencing homelessness. Portland Rose Festival is only about three months away. For 2024, the Portland Rose Festival wants to encourage you to dream forward. That's a theme that was just announced today anyway. They say that they're going to be asking everyone at this year's festival to think about what's your dream for Portland. They say they want to have an increased focus this year on regional artists, food, and fun. The festival officially kicks off May 24th with City Fair at Tom McCall Waterfront Park. The Starlight Parade is June 1st. The Junior Parade is June 5th. Fleet Week also starts that day. And the Grand Floral Parade is June 8th. And then just ahead of the Rose Fest, the 82nd Avenue of Roses Parade will return on April 27th. This is video from last year's parade. Organizers announced this week that the parade will kick off at Eastport Plaza Shopping Center on Southeast 82nd and Holgate, and then travel north along 82nd. The parade started in 2007 as a community effort, and it features a diverse group of people from the Asian and other BIPOC communities around 82nd Avenue. Someone stole the tree from the world's tiniest park in downtown Portland. Who would do that? But hey, don't worry, a new one has now been planted. We'll tell you all about it when we come back.
A new beginning after crime struck the world's smallest park in downtown Portland. Millen's Park now has a new tree after someone stole it. Portland Parks and Rec planted a dwarf Alberta spruce at Millen's Park and surrounded it with Irish moss. The tree went missing a couple weeks ago during the ice storm. Millen's Park is only uh, 500 or 452 square inches, so you can definitely notice when the tree goes missing. Calling all musical theater fans. We know what shows are coming to Portland starting next fall. And are you ready for this lineup? Because it's a good one. The new season kicks off with Peter Pan at the end of August. Then Wicked returns to Portland in October, just ahead of the new movie, which comes out this November. And then starting in January 2025, Tony Award winner Kimberly Akimbo is coming. It's a new musical about a teenager girl facing a rare genetic condition. Then Hamilton returns in March, followed by Life of Pi. And then six, The Book of Mormon, MJ the Musical, which is about Michael Jackson, of course. And in August of next year, and Juliet takes the stage. And you can find out about tickets at broadwayinportland.com. When we come back, tearing down stigma around mental health within black communities. Meet the man who is helping continue the conversation and his advice for those who need help. Let's take another live look from North Portland where the Mardi Gras parade has just begun. They're marching down Mississippi Avenue. You can hear them very excited. We got a band rolling down there. We got some people dressed up and dancing and everybody seems to be lit up. It seems like a great time. A lot of smiles, a lot of fun, a lot of cheering. Got some whistles happening. Kind of wish I was there right now, but that's okay. We have more stories to get to. We'll bring you this one. Healthier Together, sponsored by Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon. I'm all about advocacy. Um, I'm all about talking about it. But the powers to be, man, let's move past the talk and support the talk. In this week's Healthier Together, we are continuing our conversation with Dr. Keith Dempsey about mental health how to talk about it. And today the challenge is unique to the black community. Brittany Falkers spoke with Dr. Dempsey as part of her final report for KGW. 
I am a clinician, I am a speaker, I am a community advocate, I am whatever my people need. Do you see that? There's, a, there's, a, there's those nuances there. Dr. Keith Dempsey is on a mission to empower people to talk about mental health and in turn have better health overall. I love helping people. Um, I love giving them an opportunity to find that special thing within themselves, within themselves to make themselves better. He works in Portland and has taken his message on the road to break stigmas and get people talking. It's not just the talking about it. It's creating the space for listening. The reason we don't talk about it because we can't trust people with our vulnerabilities. But creating trust and breaking down stigmas around mental health comes with historical and systemic scars within the black community. There's a history in the medical systems, there's a history in the mental health systems that African American folks have not been treated well. So when you haven't been treated well and you haven't, been, you haven't gotten good outcomes, um, you are in a place that's not safe, you stay away from those places. Sometimes in the African American community, we say we're just going to keep on keeping on. Research shows that this can cause generations of families to ignore mental illness, which is then compounded by the stress of systemic racism. It's estimated that African American adults are 20% more likely to report serious psychological distress than white adults, but far less are likely to seek treatment. Statistics show that about 25% of African Americans seek mental health treatment compared to 40% of white Americans. It's time to be able to listen and take care of folks in their vulnerable space, in their vulnerable spaces. Because when we can do that, then folks will know it's okay not to be okay. And I have safety in the room. And maybe that's in a church, a community center, or in your own family or friendships. Dr. Dempsey says it's essential to create safe spaces for people to talk. And for those of us who are not mental health counselors, guess what? You all don't have to do anything but listen. It's so easy to say, if I were you, but guess what? You're not. It's so easy to say, you know what, my grandmother died, I felt that way. No, you didn't, that was, that's my grandmother, you can probably relate. I just need for you to listen and create some safe space. And when it comes to getting mental health care, it can be hard for people of color to find therapists and counselors who look like them. So when finding professional help, Dr. Dempsey suggests asking that potential counselor, therapist, or doctor if they've ever counseled a person of color and ask them about their approach. If this person says, great question, I'm glad you, you put that forth and opens it up and starts talking about anti-racist systems and starts talking about the, the racism that has been in the system has, and, and, and is okay talking about how hurtful and harmful it has been, boy, that's, that's a place you can think about being. And Dr. Dempsey is putting the onus on people in power to make real changes, to create more safe and culturally diverse places for people to talk about mental health, create community, and find help. Brittany Folkers, KGW News. For more resources and more stories to help start the conversation on mental health, visit kgw.com slash healthier together. Up next, we're getting away with Grant McComey to see an amazing eagle gathering. We'll show you where there's been a huge increase in the number of bald eagles coming to roost.
welcome back. It is time for another edition of Grant's Getaways. This week, Grant takes us to see one of the most remarkable eagle gatherings in the Willamette Valley. One of the most amazing wildlife moments is seen atop four-story tall cottonwood trees near Tangent, Oregon. It's called an eagle convocation. The regal sounding term seems fitting for up to 100 eagles that roost in the Lynn County treetops each evening. Even more remarkable, this convocation of eagles didn't exist five years ago. We've seen a wholesale increase, doubling and tripling of bald eagle numbers here in the, in the southern portion of the Willamette Valley in the last seven, eight years. For the past decade, retired wildlife refuge manager Jeff Fleischer has tallied a rapid rise in Oregon's wintertime Willamette Valley eagle population. Each one of those dots represents a specific survey trail, close to 170 now. Jeff drives over 2,400 miles of valley roads to count eagles in trees, on poles, in fields, or in flight. A typical high count used to be 50 in a day, but the next year that number exploded. We had 217, so it's in one it, day, in one day, in one day. Fleischer leads a raptor survey project, and he says the reason for more eagles in the Willamette Valley is their diet. During the winter time, a lot of sheep will, will die for various reasons, and the carcasses that are left in the field are what the eagles key on, without question. Joel Geyer says the eagle viewing opportunities are spectacular and could bring even more visitors to rural towns in the Willamette Valley. Most of the time you don't really need fancy optics to see eagles because they're so big, but if you have good optics you'll be able to see them better and you'll be able to watch other birds around too. I like overcast days. Molly Monroe is a wildlife biologist at William Finley Refuge near Corvallis. She says three Willamette Valley wildlife refuges are fine public settings to see bald eagles too. Here, the eagles dine on abundant ducks, geese, and other waterfowl. It's really nice to see their numbers back up and have them on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a treat for everybody to come out and, and have a good look at an eagle. In Lynn County with photographer Jeff Kastner, Grant McComey, KGW. Be sure to watch more of Grant's adventures in his half-hour program of Grant's Getaways Saturday and Sunday right here on KGW. And that's all the time we have. We're gonna leave you with this great shot Brandy got from the Peter Iredale shipwreck at Fort Stevens State Park on the Oregon coast. Have a great night, everyone.